Um, welcome to all of you to the annual Pierre Dubois lecture. Uh, it is my great pleasure after this day of exciting talks and great discussions to introduce our keynote speaker, Julia Ott. Professor Ott is an associate professor of history at the New School in New York City. Uh, she's a well-known scholar and public intellectual committed to advance the critical histories and the critical study of capitalism. Her book, When Wall Street Met Main Street, The Quest for an Investor's Democracy, was published by Harvard University Press in 2011. Uh, it's a book that looks at how in the 1920s participation in financial markets became the embodiment of citizenship and it won the Vincent de Santis Prize for the best book on the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Professor Ott is now uh, working on her next book entitled Wealth Over Work, The Origins of Venture Capital, The Return of Inequality and the Decline of Innovation. Her lecture today is titled From the Jim Crow South to Global Neoliberalism. Uh, Professor Ott will talk for about 45 minutes and after that we'll have time uh, for discussions and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all so very, very much for coming out. I know it's been a long um, and rich um, day and you're here sticking, sticking with the whole program. That's amazing, thank you. Um, thank you for having me, Pierre uh, Dubois Foundation. Thank you also for uh, Timaeus and Professor for, uh, Klot for Klotz and Professor Biltoff for not just all the hard work that you put into the conference but really the very careful um, intellectual and organizational work that goes on to do something like this. Um, and thank you also for your marvelous choice of theme. I'll see what I can do with it tonight. Um, it strikes me that microcosm um, serves as a useful conceptual orientation, analytic tool, and a call to narrative. So just jumping off for a second um, from the call for papers and the conference theme, um, I wanted to reflect on this, on this notion of microcosm for a second at the outset because I think, um, I, I think it's a great concept less because the small reflects the large or the grand, um, but rather because the micro reveals the macro. And when I distinguish between reflection and revelation, what I mean to suggest is that um, the precise empirical account of the particular challenges and complicates how we conceptualize the whole. And this to me is really at the heart of what historians do um, with and for social scientists um, and theorists, or as one of my colleagues uh, once said at the NSSR, at the New School for Social Research, um, you historians keep our conceptualizations honest, um, which I thought was very flattering um, and to, to our field. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth noting too, um, given, given the nature of the conference, that the, the part for the whole thinking, the kind of microcosm as reflection, rather than microcosm as revelation, um, is something that characterizes, in my view, neoclassical and ec neoliberal economic thought, um, whereas as historians, we know that societies, economies, polities, all of these are more than the sum of utility, uh, utility maximizing, rationally optimizing, atomistic, individualistic parts. Um, so how do we, uh, oh, and I was going to say, on this issue of model and model making, um, I think another thing that historians really contribute is um, the recognition that notions about how the world works or notions about how the world should work, models, social models, um, they're ripe terrain for historical investigation because they operate as technologies that legitimate challenge um, and or retrench power. So I hope to return to kind of some of these observations um, in, in my talk tonight. Um, and you know, I begin here um, as close as I'm likely to ever get to Mount Pelerin, uh, asking the question, how best to write the history of something so vast and varied and macro as neoliberalism? Um, and I'm going to answer with a narrative, with a narrative history about an obscure policy and its connection to a very small world, um, which is the American South at, in the middle of the 20th century. <clears throat> 
So let me first lay out what I mean um, when I say neoliberalism. And I just realized I didn't start my clock, um, and it's like Switzerland, and I don't even know what time it is, and then that's just like not a good way to begin, so I apologize. Okay, so what do I mean when I say neoliberalism? In my view, neoliberalism is a multifaceted configuration of power that connotes, um, that term connotes kind of four things, in my view. It's a set of coherent but flexible ideas about the efficacy and the primacy of financial markets. Two, it's a range of policies and institutions that accord with those ideas about the primacy and efficacy of financial markets. Three, um, you know, those two things in combination um, have produced a historically specific form of capitalism um, in the last 30 or 40 years, um, and it's also a particular disposition towards personal and social life. Taken together, these four dimensions of neoliberalism have produced distinctive and interrelated outcomes, inequality, financialization, globalization, the degradation of democracy, social protections, and ecology. What I hope to reveal in the talk today is that there is a racial project, or there was a racial project, and I would argue there still is a racial project, at the heart of this big historical macro phenomenon that we call neoliberalism. And I want to do that by, again, telling you a very small story in some ways about the origins of the preferential tax rate for capital gains. This aspect of the US tax code has contributed substantially to the concentration of income and wealth among the richest households in the United States, which have been, and even now remain, almost entirely white. So let's see, that is not the right thing. Okay, this is the right thing. All right, so this is what I mean by the preference for the, tax, uh, for the, for the capital gains um, in the tax code. So ever since 1922, the IRS in the United States allows the Internal Revenue Service, it allows taxpayers to keep a greater proportion of the gains that they make from their investments, from selling and trading investments, those are called capital gains, than they keep from their wages and salaries, and that's called earned income. So the capital gains are taxed at a lesser rate. Um, not only do investors keep more of their income, but this tax feature also encourages things like stock-based compensation and the carried interest exemption among fund managers. These things really fuel excessive compensation or enormous levels of compensation you know, in those industries. Um, so for all of these reasons, um, the, the reduced rates that are levied on capital gains under, under, have undercut the progressivity of the US tax code. Um, and that's always been the case. So this from Piketty and Saez, um, if you look at the, the distribution of, um, of, of income, both the top 1% and the top 10% um, you know, have a greater share um, when you um, include their capital gains income um, in, that, in that, total comp, that total calculation of you know, their, their share of all income. Okay. But moreover, uh, what's also important to recognize is that the households that benefit from the preferential tax treatment of capital gains have always been overwhelmingly white. Okay. Um, oh, this is another one that shows you um, in terms of um, what the share of total income is for the top 1% um, and the top 10%. I'm sorry, I can't. I thought this was a good matter, but now I'm not reading my thing. Um, that the share of capital gains, you know, is really overwhelmingly taken by this top 10 percent, um, and and you know, the, and the top one percent is really um, remarkable. Okay, we can't um, trace this out by race, but we can look at some proxies. So um, if we look at capital income, which comes from the kinds of investments that would also uh, ha have a capital gain, um, you know, we see this overwhelming whiteness of these households, um, also stock ownership. Um, and then in more recent years, the survey of consumer finances lets us do that kind of work. And you can see how overwhelmingly um, white um, capital gains are. Okay, so the capital gains tax preference privileges wealthy white households by allowing them to keep more of their income. That quickens their accrual of wealth and it widens thereby the racial wealth gap. And what I wanna argue is this is no just accident of history. Because beginning in the 1930s, white supremacists in the US Congress really 
took up the capital gains preference as um, you know, one of their most important sort of policy tools. Um, and they did this because they were forced to rethink their political alliances, to reframe their commitments, and to remake their policy tools um, as they struggled to defend their elite white privileges against challenges by a multiracial labor movement and the modern liberal state. In doing so, these strict segregationists made political alliances with leaders of Wall Street, and together they advanced new models of the economy that formed policies like the capital gains tax preference that would shape the contours of inequality down to our, in, in a very racialized way down to our present day. Okay, so going back um, quickly to the actual tax rates, um, you can see that you know the the preference for the capital gains um, doesn't really come in until about 1922. It's sort of a compromise after World War I. It reflects a new consensus after World War I that the tax code um, should reflect and um, support the interests of investors in, in the wake of the bond drive campaigns of World War I. Um, after that, all through the Roaring Twenties, those who continued to defend this tax break for investors, most notably the New York Stock Exchange, um, they celebrated how, how investors, the beneficiary of this tax break, turned the wheel of the economy and guaranteed growth, stability, and equity in the economy when they realized gains on their investments and then reinvested those gains in the economy, in, in new businesses and new enterprises. Um, obviously, the crash of 1929 kind of called this model into question, but capital gains tax rates held steady. Um, Congress um, doesn't, and, and even Roosevelt doesn't sort of mess with it at first. It's only in about 1935 when revelations that some of the richest American households had avoided paying any income tax and um, Senator Huey Long of Louisiana, the populist kingfish, um, he la launches his sort of share the wealth redistribution, um, wealth redistribution campaign. At that point, Roosevelt is sort of pushed to try to raise taxes, you know, kind of pushed on the left flank to raise taxes in an effort to dilute the concentration of income and wealth in the United States. So taxes are raised, as you can see, in the 1930s, but that huge preference between the taxes that are levied on earned income and the taxes that are levied on capital gains, it still remains. So how does this happen? I mean, you sort of think in 1935, like I said, with uh, you know, kind of robust uh, labor movement going, um, you know, pressure, um, pressure from Huey Long, you know, you'd think that maybe this would be a moment, you know, the federal government trying to raise revenue to um, get the economy um, uh, going with, with programs of relief and whatnot. Um, what happens is that the New York Stock Exchange, it's, and they're already engaged in a battle against securities regulation, um, they demand the elimination of capital gains taxes um, for the same kind of logic that, that they were saying before in the 20s. The idea being that um, in the Depression, uh, capital was, was frozen, quote unquote, um, in existing investments, and tax policy, um, reducing taxes or eliminating taxes on capital gains entirely, would encourage investors to trade, release um, funds into the economy in the forms of like new investments, um, new businesses, and this would create more jobs, um, more productivity, less inflation, faster growth, and even more tax revenue, right? So sort of a supply side precursor. Um, let me note really quickly, I'm gonna pause my narrative and you probably all know this. Um, so this economic model does sort of anticipate ideas that we associate with supply siders in the 70s and 80s. But neither in the 30s nor in the 70s nor today um, can this model actually boast much empirical support. When investors trade stocks and bond, money simply passes from those who wish to sell, uh, I'm sorry, from those who wish to buy to those who wish to sell, and the corporations um, or other issuers of securities, they don't receive any funds. Um, and an investor who makes a gain, they might reinvest that in, in a new business that you know, provides jobs and grows the economy, but they also might not. They might spend it, they might invest it in existing assets and create a bubble, um, and certainly fiscal policy, fiscal history, um, you know, down to the present day, does not suggest the claim or support the claim 
that when you reduce taxes on the rich, um, you're going to, they're gonna pay for themselves or they're gonna grow the economy, okay? Um, but these are very old ideas that trace back to this moment. So back to my story now. Um, as the New York Stock, so the New York Stock Exchange now is demanding the repeal of capital gains taxes. Um, and the president of the Stock Exchange wars restore incentives for private enterprise, restore confidence to capital. Um, Richard Whitney, the president of the Stock Exchange at the time, um, he demands, or he, he asserts that economic recovery has to come through, quote, private, initiative of private enterprise, the intelligence of private management, and the courage of private capital, with private capital being formed out of the, quote, steady investment of the saving of individuals. The investor must be restored to the investor must be restored a right, this quote, a right to change the form of his investment without the prospect of taxes weighing upon the decision, okay? So here, again, we see this model. Uh, we see the kind of the financial market as a sort of microcosm in this, in this model of how the entire economic and political system works. It's centered on individual investors and financial markets, and what's really important is the liquidity of financial markets. So the idea of capital gains taxes taxes impede the liquidity of financial markets. All of this is meant to uh, challenge the New Deal in a really comprehensive and fundamental way. Um, you know, it's the, the protection of labor unions, federal agencies of regulation, planning and coordination, and most importantly, the Federal Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which at that point um, basically was serving as a substitute for the entire prostrated financial system in the United States. So for the exchange, whether a particular New Deal policy or agency was planning production or trying to raise employment, controlling prices or wages, trying to stimulate consumers' income, trying to redistribute wealth, all of these things, a whole kind of kit and caboodle of New Deal experimentation, it all violated, quote, the freedom of the individual to exercise his unfettered judgment in taking initiative, assuming risks, and adapting himself to changing circumstances. At the center of this entire kind of model of the polity and the economy, the New York Stock Exchange positioned itself, uh, the quote unquote, continuously liquid security market, because in their view, in their model, the prices that the stock exchange produced, quote, governed the entire competitive interlocking arrangement that was the economy, um, because you know prices are sort of signaling to people where to allocate resources. Um, so this this whole model of the economy it really prefigures you know anything that Hayek has to say in the 40s and the 50s. Um, so this all sounds you know good and and there's continuation here with a lot of the things that the stock exchange was saying about financial markets in the teens and the 20s. Um, you know it doesn't but by themselves complaining uh, it doesn't stop the revenue acts of the 1934 and 1935. But what happens is Roosevelt overplays his hand. And what he actually tries to do, um, having heard from the stock exchange, oh, there's idle capital out there. If we thaw it out, if we release it, um, we can put that, that funds into circulation and kickstart business. And he and his, um, uh, he, he and his administration decide that what they're going to do is levy a, an undis uh, undistributed corporate profit tax. So they're gonna tax retained earnings. At this point, American corporate leaders really freak out and turn against the New Deal, which they'd sort of been cautiously participating with up until that point. They perceive the undistributed profits tax as posing a dire threat to their finances and to their autonomy as executives. So they begin to understand that you know, if they wanna repeal uh, if they want to prevent an undistributed corporate pro profit tax, they're going to have to come up with some other way um, to, you know, quote unquote, thaw idle capital. And they go over to the exchange's way of thinking. You know, don't tax our um, undistributed profits to try to get us to sort of disgorge you know, our retained earnings um, and get money into the economy and get money into the treasury. Rather, reduce capital gains taxes so investors will take a profit and you can kind of get capital circulating again. So, so, the, so now the stock of financial leaders and corporate leaders begun to come together to oppose the New Deal all, all over this issue of taxation and really specifically, are we gonna do the corporate taxation thing or are we gonna do the capital gains thing? At the very same time, 
um, Roosevelt gets reelected, and this galvanizes his foremost adversary in Congresses, the, la the landslide victory. And these are who are the, the folks that I call the irreconcilables. They are the Senate Democrats who are wholeheartedly in opposition to the New Deal and who control the Senate Finance Committee. And there are four guys, talk about microcosm, um, talk about little, it's literally four guys and they are chairs of the Senate Finance Committee for 35 years um, with like a two year break when like Taft and the Republicans, you know, take take the Senate for literally like two years. Um, these guys, these irreconcilables, they forge new connections with Wall Street leaders, and together they organize actually the first bipartisan alliance against the New Deal. They call themselves the Conservative Coalition, and they actually managed to beat back both the undistributed profit taxes and the capital gains taxes, marking sort of like the end of the most robust period of New Deal reform. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about these irreconcilables, because this is how we're gonna get to the Jim, this is why we're in the Jim Crow South. Um, these guys are, as I said, it's four people, and their names are Josiah Bailey of North Carolina, um, and then the three Senate chairman, uh, Senate Finance Committee chairman, Harry Byrd, Walter George, and Pat Harrison. Byrd from Virginia, George from Georgia, and Harrison from Mississippi. When they took up the ideas and the policy preferences of the stock exchange um, after 1936, it was a very unlikely association. Traditionally, Southerners, pro Southerners um, support uh, progressive taxation. Traditionally, they support balanced budgets. And traditionally, they look upon Wall Street with a great deal of hostility. But what they realize is that this expanded federal state that wielded extend new and extended economic powers and recognized a multiracial labor movement, this all posed a very serious threat to states' rights and to the rule of white wealth in the South, in the Jim Crow South. So here's the, you know, here's, here's the point I wanna stress. For the irreconcilables, for these literally four guys um, who, who um, you know, uh, maintain this tax preference, you know, and, and this is kind of, you can see what the, what the gap looks like at mid-century, when you might least expect it, because this is first supposed to be an egalitarian, a more egalitarian capitalism, a more liberal moment. Um, they're doing this not because of macro, their beliefs about macroeconomic or fiscal efficacy. I mean, they talk that way, but fundamentally for them, this is about power. This is about their power. Um, it's, the pow it's the power of white males elites in the Jim Crow South. And they believe, rightly so, that their power is eroding. Okay, Bailey, Byrd, Harrison, and George all come from areas in the American South that political scientist Robert Mickey identifies as quote unquote pockets of authoritarian rule. It's a single party rule, Democratic Party. Um, there's a system of racial segregation and terror that goes by the name of Jim Crow. And both blacks and poor whites are disenfranchised. So these guys, you know, their poll taxes, property qualifications, I mean, it's like they're sitting on the Senate Finance Committee literally having gained the vote of like a couple of thousand people in Virginia, a couple thousand male, you know, a very, you know, and they stay, as I say, in these huge positions of power um, for decades because it's a one-party rule. They're unchallengeable in primaries. They get to the Senate. The Senate is, you know, committee um, responsibilities and leadership is uh, apportioned according or allotted according to seniority, right? Um, they represent the interests of New South industrialists and urban elites, large landowners and merchants in the region. And they stand for maintaining the unchallenged political rule of white wealth. So it's not just about segregation, it's about white wealth. They sit on top of single parties that mix patronage and voter suppression. Again, this is why they can get by um, with staying in office for so long. They can't be challenged in their home state, not even by poor whites. Safe in the Senate, they, lead, they, they uh, hold these important committee positions for decades. But by 1936, what they realize is that the Great Migration and the long civil rights movement was well underway. Powerful, radical movements of interracial unionism and popular front agitation had already begun to hit the South. And New Deal programs of relief, employment, and lending 
were, even though they were administrated, administered locally in ways that were supposed to sort of, you know, not challenge racial segregation, they are building networks of patronage behind Roosevelt um, at the expense of sort of the power and the prestige and the ability to sort of be, be pa local patrons and power brokers, you know, in their like kind of local enclaves. So what the irreconcilables feared is that poor whites in these New Deal patronage networks, you know, the guys who are getting the jobs and, and um, to work on public projects and th things like this, um, that they are, if emboldened by federal largesse, they're gonna push back against these elite enclave rulers. They've done it before. Um, and they may even push back against segregation. They've done that before, okay? So, you know, between the, the Civil War and the turn of the 20th century, you see, um, you know, populist, interracial populist movements in the South that are kind of, you know, trying to um, govern in an interracial way. Um, and, and these guys, the guys that I'm talking about, they started their political career, careers with campaigns of white terror um, to purge those populist governments at the turn of the century. So, you know, they're seeing this now, you know, they've had 30 years of, of being at the top, sitting at the top of the hierarchy, um, and, and they're worried that the New Deal is compromising this, and, and it is. It's beginning to. Um, so, and national developments also alarm these irreconcilables because within the Democratic Party, the, ch the, the power of the South um, within the Democratic Party is being challenged by the racially integrated pro-civil rights Congress of Industrial Organizations, the labor unions. Um, so let me just show you this picture. Okay, all right. So this is like everything. It's like literally embodies everything that these guys are freaking out about. So you've got Roosevelt, obviously. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a CIO political action committee. Um, unions started the first political action uh, committees in this period. Um, and this is an interracial group of workers um, and the, you know, literally redhead and dark eyes. You know, that is an interracial child that Ben Shaw is depicting here um, in this poster um, rallying folks to the CIO, to the Democratic Party, okay? And these posters are going up in the South. So this really literally embodies what the irreconcilables um, feel that Roosevelt is bringing to them. So as black and white ethnics are building up the union and party membership in the industrial North and Midwest, they are desecrating the irreconcilable's devotion to racial apartheid and low wage labor. So at this point, the irreconcilables are asking themselves the following. Will the Democratic Party allow Roosevelt to reach even deeper in the South, disrupting authoritarian enclaves with programs of relief, regulation, or redistribution? Would the National Party continue to tolerate the concentration of federal power in the hands of a chief executive who spoke now like Huey Long and hearkened to the counsel of former Republicans like Harold Ickes, John Lewis of the CIO, and, and Henry Wallace? Ickes had been... Uh, uh, president of the Chicago chapter of the NAACP, he desegregates the national park system. Um, Lewis now stood at the helm of both the United Mine Workers and the CIO, some of the most militant unions, interracial unions. Josiah Bailey wrote, it is well understood here that the president is going forward with a view to a new party. He is looking to get John Lewis to assist him. He is determined to get the Negro vote, and I do not have to tell you what this means. And this is the exact kind of innuendo that Bailey had been using back in 1898 when he really um, galvanized and precipitated the Wilmington race riot, which ended um, you know, a biracial populist rule in the state of North Carolina. So they're gearing up for the exact same fight. But things are different now. Now they need new, with you know, the, the National Democratic Party. So the irreconcilables realize that they're gonna need new stratagems. They're gonna need new allies if the rule of white wealth were going to be protected. In 1937, a wave of strikes and a double dip recession hit the US economy. And biracial organizing once again disrupts textile mills, iron works, and tobacco plants in the South. At this point, the irreconcilables travel to New York City and they confer with conservative Republicans in the Senate and conservative Democrats in New York City. The group includes leaders of the Stock Exchange, the DuPont uh, Corporation, and the US auto industry. 
Through these executives, the irreconcilables begin to make Republican allies, including, and most notably, Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, who's sort of, you know, Henry Ford and um, Pete, uh, um, uh, Alfred Sloan's like right-hand man. All of these folks agree that it was really time for a forceful backlash against the New Deal for quote unquote private enterprise to resume its leadership in the economy. And all of them are identifying quote, a great scarcity of venture capital. Okay, so this is actually where the term enters the American lexicon. So my, so my new book is sort of peripherally in here. Um, and venture capital is being dissipated by capital gains taxation. If you start a new business, if you sell out, um, and, and the tax man takes a lot of that money away, you have less for reinvestment, you're less incentivized to try to start a new business because the tax man's um, gonna take it away. So these folks come together, they kind of develop this concept of venture capital, and they publish and re they release the, uh, a, a document in 1930, December 1937 called the Conservative Manifesto. They start calling themselves conservatives. The number one uh, item on the list of demands is actually repeal of capital gains taxes. So yeah, they get to home rule, um, they get to, you know, uh, abolishing federal programs for the undeserving poor, they get to maintenance of states' rights, maintenance of law and order, but their number one thing is the reduction of capital gains um, taxation or the abolition of capital gains taxes, taxation. The Conservative Manifesto charted a path for conservatism, for, the, for modern conservatism, for the next half century at least. But as Bailey and Vanderberg wrote to unify the opponents of the New Deal, they anticipated neoliberal thinking. They identified investors and financial markets, not production, profits, employment, or consumption, as the wellspring of economic recovery and growth and as the safeguards against the concentration of economic and political power in the hands of organized labor or within the federal state. So the conservative manifesto doesn't change things a lot in Congress, FDR is still sort of too powerful, but it does electrify the irreconcilable supporters. And their ranks grew. And what they have to say is, is they write, is, is supporters write to these senators. What they have to say I find very interesting. So one Chicagoan uh, concurred that, quote, no one wants to invest money if he's going to have a gang of meddlers after him all the balance of his life who will destroy his investments with taxation under the pretext of, quote, being socially minded. Um, from Freeport, New York, uh, Thomas Horace Evans echoed the irreconcilables, the irreconcilables fear some predictions. Quote, the agency behind confiscatory capital gains and inheritance taxes would next move to reform the South. Evans divined, quote, the Negro will become an important feature in politics and the South will suffer. So beyond the irreconcilable and kind of financial circle, that many citizens are now beginning to apprehend that the preferential treatment of capital gains must be defended as a bulwark of white wealth and white supremacy. Okay, so it's not just sort of like a little connection that they're making idiosyncratically for themselves. I mean, it's, it's a kind of dog whistle that's developing now um, that voters are picking up on. They're understanding these connections. Roosevelt, it's back. Okay, I was saying before, he's kind of at, the, he's, he's pretty popular at the moment, and he actually, um, he actually proposes bolder plans of, of progressive taxation. But he sort of overreaches again, he tries to depose Senator Walter F. George, he really offends Southerners, the New York Stock Exchange is going down there um, and speaking and stumping on behalf of the senators that Roosevelt is trying to depose, um, defending the irreconcilables, Senator Bailey, who I, who I was speaking of or quoted from before, he fumed at this moment that much like the days of Reconstruction, Roosevelt and his administration had, quote, sent armies of so-called uplifts to meddle in Southern affairs, racial and social. Bailey swore that the South could save itself. Capital and manufacturing were flowing into the region to escape rising wages and the labor militancy um, now roiling in the North and the Midwest. Quote, we give a hearty welcome to capital, uh, Bailey allowed this, but Southern elites, quote, insist on supplying the labor under conditions that respected Southern traditions. The region would reserve the best jobs for the white population, quote, native born from six to 10 generations. 
Bailey's vision discarded all of those that the CIO represented, the black workers and non-Protestant white ethnics alike. So again, this is about an elite, wealthy, um, you know, quote unquote, Anglo-Saxon um, hierarchy or top of the hierarchy. So Bailey says, we have not been afflicted with the European proletarian migration. Our ideals and our ideas are Saxon. We do not want the sort of population we hear of in New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Massachusetts, the melting pot population, melting pot population with no affinity for true American Republican institutions who give themselves over to the influence of agitators whose names end with Ski and Stein to the Dubinskys and the Brophys. Our people have a Saxon capacity for order. They have no affinity for agitators. They are not sit-down strikers, and they cherish English liberties, the common law, and the Bible. As for our race question, Bailey continued, we do not intend that northern politicians shall have a hand in it. We propose ourselves to solve our problems, economic, social, and racial, in the southern way. Perhaps Negroes had, quote, seized the balance of power in the north, but it must not happen here, Bailey warned. We will always have a white man's party in the South, he vowed. Quote, we will not permit the Northern Democrats to frame our race policy or any social policy. So as I was saying before, FDR makes this attempt in 37 to purge the irreconcilables um, and it backfires. When the Senate reconvenes, the irreconcilables not only eliminate taxes on undistributed corporate profits and secure a steep tax reduction for capital gains, but they also trounce anti-lynching legislation. It all kind of like happens within days um, and they un all understand it as being sort of part of the same project. So this climate, I'm sorry, this climax in the fight over capital gains taxation, the ideas and the coalition that gave rise to it, it really turned the tide against the New Deal. And for the remainder of the Roosevelt's pregnancy and for two decades after, these four guys commanded a conservative bloc in Congress that checked liberal efforts to restructure the economy further, to enlarge social benefits, or to extend even basic federal protections to African Americans. When the irreconcilables rolled back taxes on capital gains, they managed to buoy existing white wealth and to undercut the progressivity of the income tax code. From this end of the Second World War until the 1960s, the share of total wealth held by the top 10% and the top 1% in the United States, I don't have a chart for this, but I'm talking now about the wealth share of the top 1% and 10%. Okay, it's almost exclusively a white, a white group. Okay, it stabilizes. It doesn't, it had, be, it had been falling, but it stabilizes. In Europe, that wealth share keeps declining into the 1970s. So they really do manage to put a break on, you know, even the mild redistribution that was going on um, in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. So to preserve, the ironic thing though is that to preserve the political rule of elite whites, the irreconcilables actually hardwired that preferential treatment of capital gains taxes into the financial machinery of the very same modern liberal state that they abhorred. They trimmed away at modern liberalism to you know, try to undercut that progressivity, try to uh, check that wealth, minor wealth distribution, minor, minor but significant. But even as these self-identified conservatives were chipping away at modern liberalism, they were simultaneously sowing the seeds of neoliberalism. Okay, so let's see, how are we on time? So World War II presents new threats, okay? New powers for the president, a massive expansion of federal state and its authority, its role in the economy, more militancy um, and growing membership of organized labor, and a lot of forward momentum on the issues of civil rights for African Americans. Southern workers are poor black and white alike. They're pouring into unions. They're engaging in wildcat strikes. They're leaving Dixie in the Great Migration forcefully pushing back against the re region's ruthless low-wage regime that the irreconcilables and their patrons, you know, still sit at the top. But things are getting very unstable. Simultaneously, the Second World War is restructuring the nation's capital markets, and it's doing it most forcefully through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which establishes a new subsidiary called the Defense Plant Corporation, which is the most important source of investment in the nation and indeed the entire world. Taken altogether, by 1945, 
Um, Uncle Sam, through those agencies, actually holds the largest portfolio of state-owned assets outside of the Soviet Union. So the rapidity and the scale of wartime public investment contradicts the claims about the potency and the efficacy of individual investors and private financial markets, claims upon which that preferential treatment of capital gains had always been based. And yet, let me see if I can go back to my tax rates. And yet, at this very same moment in the 1940s, capital gains taxes are lowered. Even though expenses, federal expenses are ballooning, even though the income tax base taxes more and more Americans, it now becomes a majority tax. The, most, the, the majority of Americans have to pay income taxes, and yet capital gains taxes are lowered. Well, how does this happen? Let me introduce you to a very, very devious gentleman by the name of Emil Schramm. He had been the chairman of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He had been the chairman of the Defense Plant Corporation, right? So this you know, public agency that owns like a quarter of all of the plant in the United States during World War II. But in 1941, he resigns his post and he goes and he becomes the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, at this point, his boss, Jesse Jones of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, tells him, you know, don't do it. The stock exchange is going to get nationalized. They're going to go out of business. They're going to get nationalized. There's no trading. There's no volume. You know, why are you doing this? But Schramm, a lifelong Democrat, he decides, if I can get a change in that tax law, trading will pick up um, if I can get capital gains tax cuts. In public, he sings a somewhat different tune. Um, again, he kind of goes back to the model about uh, investors and financial markets and venture capital and all of that kind of stuff. And he's you know, telling audiences of Warren Bond subscribers and, and, and business associating meetings and campaign rallies, you know, he's saying that it's very important um, to prepare for um, the post-war period, free up equity capital, um, make sure that we're revivifying um, venture capital, which he describes impotent at this time, um, and that, you know, if we don't prepare for post-war uh, post readjustment now um, by encouraging private investment and encouraging capitals through these, these capital gains reductions, you know, we're going to have socialism. The, our, the Reconstru Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the DPC, are never going to go away, um, and that'll be, you know, individual liberty, political freedom, it'll all be gone. You know, this is the guy who ran those two agencies. So it's, it's pretty powerful for him to turn around and tell the American public that this was all wrong. Now, it helped that Schramm had endeared himself to the irreconcilables when he refused Roosevelt's request to fire the friends of Senator George. Um, from their RPC, RFC positions back in 38. So this is something that, you know, when I said Roosevelt was on the attack against the irreconcilables, Schramm, at that time, um, chairing the RFC, he doesn't, he won't go along with this. George now chairs the Senate Finance Committee, and as Schramm recalled in a oral history done in the 1980s, the two of them got to know each other very, very well. Um, and basically, I'll get to the punchline later, but basically this means that um, Schramm and the New York Stock Exchange, not in any scare quotes, are outright bribing Walter George uh, and at, at this point in time. So he is, through bribery, um, able to get Walter George to, quote, handle the tax bills in Congress according to the exchange's preferences. Um, and sure enough, even though it's the middle of the war, the Revenue Acts of 1942 and 43, quote, put the stock exchange back in business by lowering capital gains taxes, um, and trading volume does pick up. Now, as I said before, Schramm is trying to sort of shape the meaning for the public about what the wartime economy meant, and uh, how it worked, and how it ought to work after the war ended. He wasn't the only person doing this, okay? And so, oops, let me go back to, it's another really scary picture by Ben Sean. Um, very scary to the irreconcilables, very scary to the exchange. Um, and the idea being that labor left and uh, racial liberals had a completely different vision for why, what the post-war war would look like. Um, and basically it would be integrated, um, it would be full employment, and it would involve the United States government, federal government, continuing to play the same ownership and you know, sort of financial um, uh, role that had been playing in the depression and uh, economy and in the wartime economy. 
okay? Schramm, of course, even though he had been at the head of these agencies, he demands an immediate post-war privatization, um, you know, for all the reasons that I mentioned before. Um, and this is exactly what happens. In identifying this federal sector as this major impediment to economic reconversion and recovery after the war, the New York Stock Exchange now is hitching itself very closely to the rising star of Senator Harry Byrd, who will succeed um, George as Senate Finance Committee Chairman, um, and he will, he will hold that position until 1965, okay? New York Stock Exchange member E.F. Hutton, who's actually a Republican, um, it works to draft or helps, uh, hopes to draft Byrd, uh, does quite a bit of fundraising trying to draft Byrd for a presidential run on a Republican ticket or a fusion ticket. And he brokers meetings with Republican donors, leaders, and politicians. Byrd ultimately decides not to run, but Democrats, reconcilable Democrats and conservative Republicans are draw, drawing much more closely together with the leaders of New York City finance, like really playing the intermediary role here. Um, they also face at that moment, you know, not all of this stuff about public investment and pu public finance, but the renewed momentum, renewed demand for, you know, an expanded New Deal after the war, okay? So this is like the moment when the Four Freedoms, Rockwell's Four Freedoms in, um, in support of Roosevelt's speech. This is kind of the moment. So in response, Schramm cautioned also that taxes, you know, not only is this a matter of like kind of privileging investors and, um, and uh, you know, acknowledging the supremacy of the financial markets, but at this point, you hear even more, more sort of recognizably conservative anti-tax arguments about how taxes should never have social purposes. You're taking from the prudent and the productive man, quote, to maintain the improvident and the indolent. Um, these kinds of more social um, and moralistic anti-tax um, arguments. For raying down into Dixie even more frequently, NYSE emissaries learned the insinuations that enclave rulers and the irreconcilables had long used to flag hazards to white supremacy. So they're giving money to these guys and they're stumping for these guys. Quote, you and I think alike, the New York Stock Exchange presidents winked at the members of the Houston Chamber of Commerce when he stumped for Hatton Summers from Texas. Hatton Summer is the biggest anti-lynching, foe of anti-lynching legislation in the Senate, you know, does all the big filibusters, and he had actually led opposition against FDR's court packing plan back in 36 and 37. So, Schramm later recalled of his relationship with, with these senators, quote, I knew all of them and I knew who I, and they knew how I was because, quote, chances are they all had clients that they had once called me to ask and they once called me to ask to see their clients when I was chairman of the board of the RFC. So all of these senators had, had you know, kind of um, uh, sent their patrons and their clients, you know, voters from their districts to SRAM at the RFC to get federal dollars. Um, so he had these great connections and he works them on the Senate Finance Committee. Whenever any dependable, quote unquote, dependable committee member, no matter their party affiliation, needed financial help to secure reelection, quote, they didn't, this is what SRAM says, they did not hesitate to send someone to see me about, quote unquote, a contribution. Schramm knew, quote, who could afford to contribute what. New York Stock Exchange visitors received him in their office and, quote, I had no trouble raising the money to help in those campaigns. I just went to them personally. He would go back and forth from Washington carrying $50,000 on his person, which is nearly $1 million per trip in 2019 dollars. And when his, his kind of inter, his interviewer in the oral history is like, what are you, what are you talking about? Isn't that illegal? And Schramm admitted, of course it was illegal. It's always been illegal. It's still illegal, and it was illegal then. But it was necessary because growing numbers of African-American voters had intensified their political influence within the Democratic Party, and so too had labor unions. They had begun to form political action committees. So it wasn't good enough now just to control your little enclave. The wider Democratic Party is changing, and the money in the Democratic Party now is coming from labor. So all of a sudden, the irreconcilables need money in a way that they never did before. You know, they just had night riders. 
Um, now they need money at the national level, and the New York Stock Exchange is the, is, is the place to go. All right, so the graft helps. I'm gonna go back to this slide about what they're all scared about. Um, graft helped, and in the end, it was only death that parted Harrison, Bailey, George, Vandenberg, and Byrd from their positions on the Senate Finance Committee. So they, they controlled it for three decades, nearly undirect, uninterrupted, and they safeguarded that tax preference on gains from investment as their number one pr priority. It was the kind of disguised social policy that, in, uh, that uh, diehard advocates of white supremacy could love, they could allow themselves to believe that the tax break for capital gains didn't contribute to the federal government's deficits, um, and it appeared race neutral for sort of those who were not in the know. And it still appears race neutral to us today. But it wasn't at its outset, and it's not in its effects. Okay, so quickly with the post-war period, because I don't think you guys want to hear me talk too, too much longer. Um, so in the 1946, the greatest sort of strike wave in American history hits, hits Wall Street. Um, Operation Dixie is getting underway in the South. All of that is brutally repressed. Schramm himself brutally represses it on Wall Street by hiring all of the oldest workers, um, which is kind of a um, really mean thing to do. Um, and the backlash against organized labor helps Republicans capture the Senate uh, for a couple years under, under Robert Taft's leadership. Um, and you know, in, in those two couple years, uh, those couple of years that Taft's sort of running things in this in, in Congress, you know, these irreconcilables and these these conservative Republicans grow closer, and they're able to fight modern liberalism to a standstill. Right? This is like when Truman wants to get national health care. You know, they really all come together for this kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, a lot of those conservative Democrats, I'm sorry, Republicans, what they really care about is like. Tax, in terms of tax policy is the taxes on topped earned incomes, depreciation schedules on corporate assets, and corporate income taxes. So again, the capital gains tax preference, it's really like the irreconcilables in the New York Stock Exchange that, that are really defending it. And it faces continued objection by the labor left and by civil rights activists alike. So through the 40s, the 50s, and 60s, it's not like people on the left didn't know. Um, at this point, the champions of white wealth decide to ponder a new tactic, and they actually start to talk about how they might be able to create a new political party um, that brings together investors in, in the, from the North and the South um, and to fight, quote, the two virulent hazards of Negro equality and state capitalism. These kinds of strategy, strategic discussion actually inform the Dixie Cat Revolt of 1948, where Strom Thurmond sort of leads a group of massive resistors um, out of the Democratic Party. And while the irreconcilables, like Byrd, who's chair of the Senate Finance Committee, they, they don't bolt the Democratic Party at this point. I mean, they sort of have too much to lose. Byrd is actually the person who coins the term massive resistance. So these guys will really be the most you know, die on the hill resistors to integration after Brown versus Board of Education. But when they start to talk about, you know, how investors could be a new conservative constituency, there's not that many investors. Um, so the New York Stock Exchange begins a mass campaign to grow the number of American investors. Um, and what's remarkable about this is, is, well, first of all, they have some success doing it. It's all white households. Um, but what's really remarkable about it is that they, because they have this vast reach, customers, employees, shareholders of listed corporations, they can distribute so much political propaganda. Um, it's, in 1959, they're able to distribute 75 million copies um, of this. Um, and um, uh, you know, and there's there's films and there's there's all kinds of public relations stuff that's about spreading mass stock ownership, but it's also about you know what is the investor's perspective on economic policy. Um, and one of the reasons why they care so much about individual share ownership at this point is because labor's financial power is growing with the growth of pension funds. Um, and neither the reconcilables nor the stock exchange want to have to deal with you know a powerful labor movement that is now not just powerful in the sphere of production but also in the sphere of finance. So the preferential tax rate on capital gains holds steady until 18, I'm sorry, 1965, when actually, um, you know, Byrd dies or steps down. He has a brain tumor. 
Um, the New York Stock Exchange you know, celebrates him as their closest ally. And the torch then passes to Senator Russell Long. Senator Russell Long's the next chairman of the Finance Committee, and he's, he's chairman of the Finance Committee um, until about 1990 or so. So like literally now I'm talking about five guys. But Russell Long, the thing that's amazing about Russell Long is he plays this really important role in sort of literally whitewashing the origins uh, the racial origins of the capital gains tax preference. He was the son of Huey Long. So his father's commitment to share your wealth becomes Russell Long's commitment to own your own share. That's the New York Stock Exchange's sort of mass investment campaign of the mid-century. Um, and Long then takes up defense of the capital gains taxation, or ta capital gains tax preference, you know, until, until the 1980s. Um, through the 1980s. When he retires, he actually joins the board of the stock exchange. But what happens under Long's, um, Long's um, tenure is that new kind of young members of the Democratic and the Republican Party, um, they take up capital gains relief as their signature issue. So this is Lloyd Benson, this is Jack Kemp, and this is the New York Stock Exchange's favorite, William Steger, um, who died of a heart attack very young, but he was like their choice for president, um, and they were really trying to push him, um, and then they had to switch over to Reagan instead. So in 19, and, and Russell Long plays this like really important role in terms of again, like sort of whitewashing the, whitewashing the origins and allowing these young Turks and voters to believe that this is some sort of like new thing. Um, and with the Revenue Acts of 1978 and 1979, the, you know, Russell Long and these young guys are able to kind of reframe the capital gains tax preference as um, a new tool that has nothing to do with segregation, that has nothing to do with white, I'm sorry, that has nothing to do with white supremacy, the, the supremacy of white wealth, um, but it's a market-oriented reform um, that is a response to the left's demands for tax reform that were taking place in the 70s and 80s, the tax revolts of the 1970s. Um, so these now, in the Revenue Acts of 78 and 79, they're a breakthrough victory for Republican supply-siders and the market-oriented Democrats that anticipated the new Democrats of the, of the Clinton era. So at this point now, in 1978, the neoliberal era has truly arrived. Okay, one minute in conclusion. What did this micro story about the origins of one teeny tiny little pox policy reveal to us about the origins and the nature of neoliberalism as a whole? Well, I would say a couple of things. If neoliberalism is a set of ideas that elevate finance, we see that these ideas are flexible, that they congeal only gradually dependent on local contexts in ways that can only be understood empirically. The justificatory framing for capital gains tax preference, it drew from many sources, some of them liberal, some of them conservative, all of them anticipating neoliberal thought. Um, and they owed more to the common sense and the wishful thinking of financiers and legislators than they did to the theories of academic economists that we more often recognize and study as historians. Number two, if neoliberalism is a set of policies and institutions, then we really need to understand, again, empirically, how those policies and institutions articulate with or mutually constitute or draw upon other, maybe pre-existing hierarchies and structures and power. Okay, so neoliberal policies and institutions that give prior to, priority to investor and investment, they don't involve a retreat of the state or a retreat of power despite emancipatory, emancipatory meritocratic, or disruptive claims. Rather, we should think of marginalized and exploited populations as only differently marginalized and exploited and the privileged and the powerful as only differently privileged and powerful. So in conclusion, from 36 to 65, Southern Democrats who controlled the Senate Finance Committee marshaled federal tax policy to retrench the power of wealth and to disguise the, racial, the racist nature of that project. For them, no boundary separated economic relations of class from social and cultural relations of race. Neither for them nor for their allies on Wall Street and within the Republican Party. Together, these champions of white wealth always understood economic inequality and white supremacy as mutually constitutive.
beginning in the 1930s, they worked to remake and to obscure that entanglement when they were faced with the possibility of an anti-racist labor rebellion and with the emergence of the modern liberal state. Mid-century Southern senators and New York City's financial leaders understood themselves, they identified themselves as conservatives, but as they fought to safeguard existing political, economic, and racial hierarchies, they laid the foundation for neoliberalism. Today, the preferential treatment of capital gains embodies fundamental assumptions of neoliberal thought, it furthers the dominance of finance in our economy, and it promotes the concentration of income and wealth at the highest and the widest reaches of their distribution in the United States. Fascinating and rather chilling account. Um, I think you get to sit to my left. You can stand. So we have now about 20 minutes to take questions. Uh, the mic will be passed. Mathieu, right? Thank you. It was really fascinating. I have a question. I've recently read these two books by Queen Slobodian, Globalists, which is also. Uh, history of neoliberalism where race and let's say co uh, connection between the southern US apartheid and Wilhelm Röpke, a very famous uh, let's say German Swiss economist who spent his career here is also uh, let's say at the one of the center of the the book and then Nancy Maclean about the public choice Virginia school where you also have another neoliberal uh, let's say uh, uh, thread with a very strong let's say uh, anti-civil rights, uh, di anti-democratic dimension. How would you relate your narrative to this other narrative? Because this, this is something that is coming up now into, let's say, the history of neoliberalism, this, let's yes. say, race uh, component, which is much more important yes. than what was thought before. Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a great observation question. I mean, it's, it's the racial component, but I think it's also, is this on? Oh, it is? Okay. Um, it's the racial component, but I think it's also the idea of thinking about neoliberal thought and neoliberal policy and institutions as being grounded in, if you want to call them more marginal, marginal places or spaces of the global south, where you can sort of do things under autocratic leadership um, that you maybe can't do in other places with, say, a robust or more difficult to do in places that do have, like, say, a robust organized you know, work or labor union and things of that nature. Um, so with Nancy McLean's book, Buchanan is coming out of, he, he lives in Bird's world. He lives in Bird's backyard. Um, Nancy doesn't really get into, I mean, she sort of mentions Bird um, in the book. Uh, she kind of didn't dig into any kind of personal connections between the two of them. But I think that's fine. I mean, it's the same milieu. Right, I mean, Buchanan is working and developing his ideas in the very same kind of problematic, right, that uh, other other autocratic enclave rulers are facing in the mid-century South. Um, so he is as much of a champion of those autocrats and those irreconcilable opponents of, you know, not just racial integration, but you know, socioeconomic redistribution and socioeconomic justice. Um, so he's very much working in the same world. Um, you know, Buchanan is not at the outset as in that milieu of like sort of where, where the money meets the politicians. You know, he's like, that's not his space um, necessarily. Um, with Quinn Slobodian's book, it's a wonderful book um, and it, I think it kind of started out trying to understand like where the WTO was coming from um, with the recognition that the ideas that informed it, you know, reached back into the teens and the 20s. Um, I think what, where I would like to, to go and meet up with, and, and it's very much heavily drawing upon um, the thinking of academic economists, right? Um, and more about trade and sort of less about finance. Where I'd kind of like to go in the future is to try to understand um, how actually like market actors and the private sector um, get brought along um, and become sort of um, uh, actors in these developments as well. So for example, you know, I know that the New York Stock Exchange is very, um, very plays a leading role in starting the um, International Federation of Stock Exchanges, the FIBV. Um, and, 
There's a whole, say for example, there's a whole um, flurry of stock exchanges founded in the 50s and 60s in the global south. Um, which, again, sh might strike one as kind of odd, right? When a period of heavy nationalization of industry, why do we have stock exchanges? But it's like, where are the spaces where kind of local business elites and financiers meet up with the ideas that come out of maybe the global north, whether those ideas be from industry leaders or whether they become from economic economists? And I think we have to really look at all of these people in conversation with one another. Um, and I don't think that we do that quite enough. Does that answer your question? Thank you. That was kind of long, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really very interesting uh, presentation. I wonder if I could push you a little bit on actually one of your, your fairly central claims, which is, in, if not necessarily the functional, at least the symbolic significance of the, the capital, tain, uh, capital gains uh, tax uh, preference. Because if you look at other works on that coalition that you're talking about, and I'm thinking particularly of Ira Katz Nelson's work, uh -huh. um, one of the things that's interesting is that if you reflect on the fact that in certain senses the, the conservative coalition between particular Republicans tied to Wall Street on the one hand and Southern Democrats on the other was relatively short-lived or it was episodic, it was, it was certainly not continuous. If you reflect on the fact that at the same time, especially in the House of Representatives, that there was a very, very strong push, even as you had uh, Southern committee chairmen who were trying to protect, you know, um, white and white supremacy and so forth at the same time still with more than just minor uh, f flings with, with uh, Roosevelt style liberalism, you could construct an alternate story. And the alternate story is that the capital gains tax as it were moves from um, something that's a kind of, of a prize for Wall Street and that's just part of a bargain that's made, albeit of course an important bargain in the 30s and, and, and 40s, to something that's in a kind of sense, and excuse me because I try to avoid this language usually, but a kind of floating signifier where when you then look ahead in the 1970s and especially the, the kind of origins in the Democratic Party in the United States of the US version of, of neoliberalism, the kind of quote freeing unquote uh, of, of, of New Deal era restrictions on all kinds of financial operations and the eventual triumph under people like Clinton of, 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 of the, that so-called consensus at the time. If you look at that and you look at analogous um, changes that occur, for example, in the French Socialist Party around the same time, or analogous changes in the British Labour Party around the same time, it strikes me that one could construct a story that this, that the, the significance of the capital gains test is less as necessarily a symbol of this kind of overture toward Toward, um, toward a policy in which one relies on, on finance, on relatively unrestricted uh, flows of finance, and rather as a kind of tool, if you will, a kind of Lego block that can be used by, by, by different sides for different purposes. So I just want to put that proposition to you. But as I said, thank you. It was a really fascinating talk. Okay, well, sort of, thank you for that. Um, sort of working backwards a little bit about you know, kind of the concept of both sides. I mean, one thing that, I'm, I'm trying to kind of do is, in the case of U.S. historiography, is you know kind of to relax the sense of, of that, that the bipartisan, or I'm sorry, the partisan divide um, is really you know how useful is that for really narrating you know the the history of U.S. politics in the 20th century. Um, you know it's certainly quite customary um, to do so, but the fact of the matter is um, you know as I try to show in this paper, these policies and these ways of thinking are kind of always bipartisan, um, or, you, know, or you can find folks on, in both parties, I won't call them bipartisan, but you can, they, you know, they kind of transcend party in that way. Um, and they're very, very old. Um, and so the interesting thing is sort of like how, to me at least, is you know, how are their origins kind of get obscured, uh, you know, I use the term whitewashed in the talk, um, you know, and folks like Long and Benson 
are this bridge, you know, and I sort of gestured at this just at the end, they're this bridge before these, between these like older segregationists and those new, you know, Democrats that you, you think of when we think of Clinton. Um, so, and then, you know, when you're talking about like the comparative um, in other countries, I mean, I would sort of really recommend to everybody not to see it, whether it's the 1970s or the 1980s, that this stuff just, you know, kind of spontaneously, or maybe not spontaneously, but, you know, emerges in various different countries um, because of, and, and sometimes this is the way that we talk about it, because of, you know, economic crisis and stagflation and, you know, everybody, nobody knows what to do when we need a new playbook. Um, but actually that um, they, they are very old playbooks, um, you know, that had, uh, their own logic and their own agenda that was like very long standing. And again, it kind of goes back to the other response. Like you need, a, you know, you need a context um, in which, you know, in, in the case of the story that I'm telling you, you know, there's there's some autocracy in the system. Um, <laughs> There's some, an, there's some anti-democratic elements in the system that these guys could keep power for so long, despite the fact um, that they're, you know, it's challenged over and over and over again. Um, you know, so, so I would imagine that, you know, that would be kind of a fruitful line of inquiry um, in other national contexts um, as well, that it's, it's not, not just like an idea that, and then, oh, hey, you know, it, it gets picked up by powerful people, much less, oh, and then it works. Um, but rather, um, they're being developed and incubated for a very long time, sometimes to serve other purposes that then kind of get redirected and co-opted maybe after the 70s or 80s. Um, and continue, I'll just conclude with this, continue to have the same effect in the US case in terms of really um, uh, driving the racial wealth gap even though we forgot that it came, or maybe never even knew that it was sort of a segregationist commitment in the first place. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that, as I was saying in the conclusion, like really looking at the way in which these things um, articulate, mutually con constitute, or def draw upon um, other relationships and hierarchies and structures of power in their kind of host communities, I think is a really important task. Yes, I'm not a historian, but I have a historiographical question. On the status of this group, the authors of the Conservative Manifesto, as a macrocosm, as you began, is it, because I hesitate hearing, hearing your talk, is it really a group of four, five, six people who did manage to manipulate U.S. politics and U.S. economic policy during all this period of time because they were at the center of a sort of a network, the nexus of, of different trans relationship interests, vested interests and all that? Or is it a symptom revealing an evolution of North American capitalism? And, and in your talk, you I didn't really understand. I didn't read the paper. We, <coughs> nobody had the paper. Maybe there's no paper for the moment. I don't know. Uh, I didn't read the book. Uh, so, so well, that was my question. That's a great question. And it, it will be a paper published very shortly in a new journal that um, Professor Bilthoff and I have helped to co-found, um, which is called Capitalism, a Journey, uh, no, a journal, not a journey, a journal of economics and history. Do I have this right? We've sort of kicked around. So, you know, you'll, you'll be able to, to see it in its, its full whatever um, and follow it perhaps more closely, I hope more closely. Um, but to your point um, and to your question, which is, I, I thank you for. Um, so what I'm trying to introduce in here, I mean, yes, the guys that I'm talking about, I call them guys because they are white men, no question about it, um, they really do control tax policy, federal tax policy in this country for a very long time at mid-century. And they stand outside, uh, Eric Katz Nelson's book was referred to, they kind of stand outside the modern liberal consensus. So they're not at all interested in sort of, um, you know, um, uh, improving or mitigating the wealth distribution and doing things that can bring you that like nice U curve that we see at mid-century, um, you know, among all the other, you know, um, things that go into that, like, like labor unions and um, federal investment and social policy and all of this kind of thing. So it's kind of remarkable to me 
Um, you know, some of it is about grappling with the role of naked power, illegitimate power, and autocracy, you know, in this country and perhaps in, in other places where neoliberalism has gained ground. Like, this stuff was not democratically derived. When you're looking at these people writing tax policy, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who are going to Congress and controlling that committee for decades at a time, and literally they are returned but in a one-party system, you know, it's a couple thousand people. So I want to kind of put that on our radar screen um, that, uh, you know, we, we have to pay attention to uh, the role of autocracy. Um, and, um, and I think it's kind of remarkable as a, a historian just of, of the 20th century in American politics more broadly, I think it's kind of remarkable that these guys don't have good biographies. Um, I think it's kind of remarkable that they don't appear in history more than I think that they, I mean, that as much as I think that they should. Um, and, you know, I mean, they, they were very quiet and secretive guys, so in some ways it's not surprising. Um, but I think it's sort of like that, that kind of level of detail, which historians are, and, and empirical archival research, um, which historians are very good at doing. Thank you, Julia, for this. I have read her paper. Um, <laughs> but as you were speaking, I was just thinking about the fact that it was actually Ronald Reagan that instituted a Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So um, on the other side of the neoliberal curve, if we want to, I know it doesn't have really necessarily to taxation, but to the extent that the capital gains tax is this way in which the distribution of wealth by race is, is hidden and rehidden in the historical record. I wondered if you could just say something about the continuity, about the next phase of strategies, right? In terms of how visibility in one domain, like institutionalizing the celebration of race by a clearly ne neoliberal present president, right. like what is the trajectory that we see after this, after this period? Right. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. It's something that I'm very interested in. You know, it's kind of centrally at th some of the questions that I'm trying to ask in this book project about venture capital. Because what's interesting to me, I mean, and again, the capital gains tax preference is an interesting, you can call it a case study, you can call it a microcosm, but, you know, sort of a small scale way of thinking through your question, um, at least in this one instance. Um, and, you know, white supremacists have, um, you know, overt white supremacists and segregationists um, who, you know, and that's most members of the Democratic Party and the American South and even beyond that because only white people are allowed to, you know, be in the party, et cetera. They have a real problem after Brown um, and after the Civil Rights Act and after the Voting Rights Act um, in terms of um, needing to, if they're going to preserve white privilege, um, they're going to figure, they're going to need to figure out other kinds of masking languages. Um, and languages of diversity, languages of meritocracy, um, languages of race neutrality. Uh, and I think the capital gains tax is an interesting, again, you know, sort of case or illustration of this, um, because it was, it was, it was very it, racial in its intentions, and it's very racial in its outcomes. Um, and, you know, what kind of happens, um, you know, from the beginning of the story into the end, to our present day, um, is, is, you know, kind of, language evolving and batons being passed um, so that you can get from a Harry Bird to a Lloyd Benson and never really think about, wait, he was the other guy's protege and like they never discuss, you know, I mean, it, it, it kind of over generations, you know, if again, in these kind of authoritarian enclaves, passing the baton in that way, but then changing your language um, as you do it, um, you know, has, I think, a very powerful disguising effect. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in other places in policy where that sort of same process is, is happening. So yeah, uh, thanks for for a great uh, and very compelling talk. I had a question on the on this U curve, um, which w when I first saw it, uh, I, I also, as you later commented, found it counterintuitive because obviously you, you wouldn't expect the bottom of the U co to coincide with the Trente Glorieuse, and then actually it, it seems to be Reagan who, who who closes the gap between the capital gains tax and the and and the income tax or, or the or the or the top tax rates. Yeah. Um, 
even though he does so mostly by lowering the income, the top <laughs> income tax rate. But 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 there's also an uptick in the in in the, in the top tax rate for the for the capital gains tax. So the first uh, very specific question would be would, would be how to explain this uptick under Reagan mm -hmm. because as just as the whole curve, it sort of is counterintuitive because it doesn't coincide at all with the standard narratives of of neoliberalism. But the larger question would be whether you know anything about how this curve looks in other countries, uh, of which you know pretty much every European country has capital gains tax, yeah. but I don't know how they historically developed their top tax rates uh, compared to income taxes, and in particular European countries in which you, you know, wouldn't suppose to find white supremacy as an important mm -hmm. leitmotiv for fiscal policy. Yeah. Uh, which I take you w w was your main explanation for explaining the, the, the counterintuitive curve in the United States. Um, okay, so those are all really great questions, and I'll try to say something quickly. Um, so the first one about, I mean, if I can go back while I'm talking, if I that coordinated, which is doubtful sometimes. Uh, see, there you go. Um, but that that was one of the things that really, and you know, goes kind of goes back to what I was saying before about you know um, revelation versus reflection, and the work that historians have to do with careful careful empirical investigation on behalf of theorists and social scientists. So. That, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like why at that modern liberal moment when actually in, you know, income inequality and wealth inequality are somewhat lessened, you know, why would you, why would you have that big gap? Like it seems like such a neoliberal thing, but it's not the neoliberal period per se. You know, and actually you get into the neoliberal quote unquote period and it's, it's narrower, right? So that, that was an inconvenient fact that needed to be explained. And you know, part of the reason why I was doing this project. The other reason why I was doing this project is because I was trying to write the epilogue for my first book and I was getting into sort of, you know, gesturing post crash, you know, what's going on with the whole small investor thing. And I don't understand why the New York Stock Exchange is always talking to Harry Bird. Um, it made no sense to me. I mean, he's a Democrat, like it's not kind of what he's known for. He's known for massive resistance. Um, and, you know, I'm expecting to see Barry Goldwater. I'm expecting to see Milton Friedman. Like I'm not expecting to see them, you know, so pally with Harry Bird. So, um, so you know, explaining those kind of facts that didn't seem to hit, fit the historiography was a lot of what motivated me. In terms of um, comparisons with other countries, I, I don't have those curves for other countries and you know, I haven't been able to find them easily, but you're right, they would be very helpful for me to look at and to think about. I can tell you this, um, I can tell you that things, of course, the 20th century have ranged a lot. You know, sometimes um, countries in uh, you know, sort of the industrialized North like don't tax capital gains at all. Sometimes it's just equalized. Sometimes there's some difference, okay? And like you see in the United States, the gap persists, but it bounces around a lot, or it shrinks and, and widens a lot. Um, but in Europe, you know, until you get Thatcher, you don't have the, the same kind of percentage of people owning the assets that are taking capital gains, right? So I think it kind of matters a little bit less in terms of what it does to like wealth and income distribution. So that's a little bit of a bunt, but you know, I, th I think it's valid. Um, the last thing you asked about, oh my goodness, there was another good question there and now I'm forgetting it. Oh, the Reagan thing. Okay, so the Reagan thing is interesting. In 86, there's like one hot year where it actually gets equalized. Um, and the reason for that is it has to do with this sort of fight. This is getting really esoteric. But there's kind of a fight in, in the Reagan administration and around Reagan about, and it, you actually anticipated a little bit with like folks like Byrd too. There's the folks who want balanced budgets and there's the folks that are supply siders, you know, who really think like debt, debt's fine, like deficits are fine because it'll grow the economy and then the treasury will get more revenue and it'll all work out in the end. And that 86 thing has to do with this kind of, you know, budget compromise, um, you know, trim the budget, raise revenue, and, and then that's just like political horse trading kind of a thing, right? About somebody wants to do this and somebody wants to do that and they kind of come up with like a weird combination and yeah, it lasts for like a year. I think we have time for a final question. Oh, I'll be very quick, uh, I was very interested in your talk, particularly the way in which neoliberalism was constructed as an antithesis uh, to, to the New Deal scheme. So in that sense, I was also interested in the global history of the New Deal as well as neoliberalism. 
So as far as I understood, the neoliberal, I mean, New Dealers had a broader vision toward the world, yeah. what world should be like after the World War II. So I was simply question is, did they have, the leaders of neoliberals in the States, had their own vision of the world beyond the United States? In that sense, uh, it's a very speculative question. Did they have any encounter with those economists or politicians of the Hmong Pelerin? Because I'm really interested in the making of a global history of neoliberalism. Not that I can tell, right? And remember I was saying the comment before, like I'm expecting them, I'm going in the archive, I'm expecting them to be communicating and they don't really seem to be. Um, and I think one thing to think about when we think about academic economists, including folks in the Mont Pelerin Society, um, they're not as concerned with finance, right? They don't really sort of have the same um, just uh, adoration for finance um, as some of these guys who are more like the industry, um, you know, I call them like the vernacular economic wisdom, the leaders of finance, the leaders of corporation, and then sort of like their pet politicians. Um, so I think that that's very interesting. There is in the, re in, and, and again, it's one of the reasons why as a historian, I'm always sort of saying, okay, but we also have to look at the economic vernacular. We can't just write about what academic economists say because who knows who's listening? Like business schools are more important. Financial press is more important. Um, the kinds of publications that investment banks send out to invest investors and give them like their market report and it's all about tax policy or whatever, that's more important for shaping understandings of how the world works or how it ought to work. Um, I will say one thing, which is that um, there is a group of people who are integral to starting the Mount Pelerin Society and send a big contingent at the beginning called the Foundation of Economic Education. Um, this is like Leonard Reed. Um, those guys are kind of more vernacular economists, if you would say so, uh, if you would like to like use that kind of terminology that I was using before. Um, they, I like how to say this quickly. So, so there is there is some engagement with economic vernac vernacular economic thinkers, um, but it's not necessarily the same ones that I study. I think we have to close here, unfortunately, but maybe the conversation will continue at dinner for some of us. Thank you very much Thank you. again. Thank you. <laughs>